So, I was binging Game of Thrones for like the eighth time, as you do, and what stood out to me this time around was how much lore and development gets brushed under the rug. I asked myself just how many plot lines were introduced but ultimately abandoned. To answer these questions, I did what any sane person would and dedicated a few months of my life compiling a list outlining them all. If you like what you see, help the channel grow by liking, commenting, and. Get on with it. This is every abandoned plotline in Game of Thrones. From murdering Jon Arryn, to pitting the Starks against the Lannisters, to killing Joffrey, without Littlefinger, there is no Game of Thrones. Something people tend to forget is that Peter Baelish wasn't just a baller, he was also very much a player with a bid for the Iron Throne as good as anyone else's. And what do you want? Oh, everything, my dear. Everything there is. What do you want? Every time I'm faced with a decision, I close my eyes and see the same picture. A picture of me on the Iron Throne. And you by my side. It's a pretty picture. Of course, what people do remember is his groundbreaking theory of chaos equals MC ladder, but by season 6, that's out the window too, as Littlefinger subjects himself to Sansa, creating no chaos, just enjoying his place at court like the good little lady he was never meant to be. You will marry a high lord and rule this castle. Now, had he at least had a whiff of the Iron Throne before seeing it snatched away from under his nose, that would have been a proper way for him to go. Not this. Sansa, I beg you. His disappointing end undermines a lot of the tension the show spent years building up. No less his and Olena's plot to kill Joffrey, a secret which, if it came out, would set half the realm against him. Together we murdered a king. If my house should fall, I will have nothing to hide. But that didn't happen. And when Baelish dies, it doesn't leave anywhere near the sort of void other major deaths did. After their ancient purpose of protecting the realm from what lies beyond the wall is rendered obsolete, the Night's Watch is still a thing for some reason. There's still Night's Watch. The show even comments on this without providing answers. Why is it still a thing? What are they protecting the realm from now that the White Walkers are destroyed, the Wildlings are friends, and the Ice Spiders not a thing in the first place? Rumpkins and snarks. <laughs> oh yeah, can't wait for snow season one. When it comes to the White Walker symbol, some speculate that the circle is a heart and the line is a sword, symbolizing the sacrifice required to defeat them. Notice also how the pin of the Hand of the King and Sansa's necklace in later seasons have the same shape. Coincidence? I mean, I guess. Then we've got this spiral, the same pattern as can be seen made by the Children of the Forest, which is obviously a cool connection, seeing as the children were the ones to create the walkers in the first place. But it kind of stops there. Presumably, the symbolism is that of history repeating itself, but apart from the tragedy of Hodor, this never actually becomes significant, and we're left asking why the White Walkers would go out of their way to leave these symbols behind at all. It's a message. No history is ever repeated, so what was the point? Was it a warning? Was it an expression of childhood trauma through modern art? Well, either way. One cool turn of events could have been to see the eternal rivalry between the Three-Eyed Raven and the Night King come full circle somehow. Maybe by one hive mind spirit overtaking the other. I'm sorry I wasn't there when you needed me. You were exactly where you were supposed to be. But that wasn't the case, so... When Miri Masdur said that Daenerys' womb would quicken only when... The sun rises in the west, sets in the east, 
When the seas go dry, when the mountains blow in the wind, like leaves. It sounded like a fancy way of saying never. But when John brings this up again in season 7, I have to wonder why the show reopened this plotline only to go nowhere with it. I can't have children. Who told you that? The witch who murdered my husband. Has it occurred to you she might not have been a reliable source of information? Like, if John had made Daenerys pregnant, cheesy as that would be, then at least we're in business. But this obviously doesn't happen, so what the hell? Jon Snow. Is Aegon Targaryen? Right, Aegon Targaryen, the Song of Ice and Fire himself. I don't want it. The long-standing mystery of Jon Snow's true parents and heritage is one of the great plot lines and plot twists of our time. And it being thrown right out the window has got to be up there with some of the biggest disappointments in television history. Careful. Oh, don't worry, we'll get on to you in a minute. Not only did they abandon decades of mystery and build-up, but also an entire social dynamic that should be there, seeing as he's king in the north and dating his aunt. The Northern Lord should quite literally be up in arms about having crowned a Targaryen, especially with so many of them having personally been part of Robert's rebellion against the mad Targaryen King Aerys not two decades prior. But hey, who wants to see intrigue like that anyway? Everyone! So, if not John, then who is Azor Ahai, the prince that was promised, aka the title of the book series the show is based on? Stannis was not the prince who was promised, but someone has to be. I don't want it. The prophecy was first brought up in season two, with Stannis flaming swords and all. Stannis Baratheon, warrior of light. Then it was Daenerys. Daenerys Stormborn is the one who was promised. Then it was John. It's not Jon Snow now. He's the prince that was promised. Then it became a contemporary American gender debate. That noun has no gender in High Valyrian, so the proper translation for that prophecy would be the prince or princess who was promised. And by the time the White Walkers rolled by. You kind of forgot. Okay, so this is kind of the big one, guys. Balancing the act of evil prince charming and savior of thousands, Jamie is asked the real questions time and time again. Who are you? And what do you want? When you hear them whispering Kingslayer behind your back, doesn't it bother you? If your precious Brandy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women and children burned alive, would you have done it? Is that what you tell yourself at night? But despite the super satisfying trajectory of a bad man who actually cares deep down, the writers abandon all of that to the benefit of a romance nobody asked for, only to go back on it and have him die with Cersei anyway. If anything, his trajectory suggested that he could have been the Valonqar who would wrap his hands around Cersei's neck and choke the life from her, coming full circle as the Kingslayer by standing up for the people by killing yet another oppressive tyrant. Alas, eight seasons of build-up straight down the drain. Thousands of men, women and children burned alive. To be honest, I never really cared much for them, innocent or otherwise. <laughs> Tyrion's kind nature is tested consistently by his family, the establishment, and pretty much everyone else, which eventually sees him snap in season 4, setting him on a path of hate and revenge. I wish I had enough poison for the whole pack of you. I would gladly give my life to watch you all swallow it. In season 5, however, Tyrion immediately goes back on all of that and derails from this trajectory. In fact, all we get from Tyrion from season 5 onwards is a series of uncharacteristically bad decisions, shunning what could have been the reverse journey of his brother Jaime. Oh, and cock jokes. Don't forget the cock jokes. At least your balls will not freeze off. Because you have no If I lost my I'd drink all the time. It's even better luck to suck a dwarf's Because I have balls, and you don't. 
A big part of Game of Thrones lore is the Three-Eyed Raven, the ancient hive mind that lures children into his cave with tinted windows to take over their mortal bodies in order to... Yeah, we don't really know, and therein lies the problem. You'll never walk again, but you will fly. Like most people, I thought this meant Bran was destined to be a dragon rider, but the show was content to keep it to some crows here and there. We never learned the true motivations of the Three-Eyed Raven and the nature of its rivalry with the Night King. Was it really so shallow as to take the Iron Throne? What about restoring and reintegrating the Children of the Forest, or I don't know, something more meaningful than making Bronn Master of Coin? Also, is there a connection between the Three-Eyed Raven and the Lord of Lights? Are they opposing deities, seeing as one sort of created the White Walkers and the other supposedly means to destroy them? Or are they one and the same, showing visions in the flames to some people and whispers in the wind to the others? Guess we'll never know. Another big introduction was the ability to interact with the past, causing time loops. In the books, it is hinted that the snooping Bran himself did not make the sound that alerts Cersei to his presence outside the window, which, after seeing how the young Ned Stark reacts to Bran in the past, implies that the same could be the case in episode 1, all in order to set Bran on his journey to become the Three-Eyed Raven, but this is, of course, never suggested by the show. Having this could have also given meaning to the White Walker spiral. But hey, what do I know? I'm just a troll on the internet. Who do you truly serve? The realm, my lord. Ah, yes, or does he? The absence of desire leaves one free to pursue other things. Varys' true motivations were quietly a big deal in the good half of the show, but after skipping town with Tyrion, Varys ceases to be active in the story, apart from teleporting around like a glorified messenger when he isn't acting as ballplank for Tyrion's cock jokes. Because you have no cock. His U-turn from supporting Daenerys to pressing Jon's claim to the throne could have been the catalyst for his moment in the spotlight, but uh, what's the line again? She is my queen. When Brandon the Curious sneaks off to check the status on the White Walker army, the Night King touches him and leaves a mark that would presumably corrupt him slowly and screw with him as he eventually works into one of Daenerys' dragons and this being how the White Walkers burned their way through the wall. But that didn't happen. So the mark is ultimately just a geotag with extra steps that leads the White Walkers to the Three-Eyed Cave and cutting Bran's training short. I'll be covering this and much more in an upcoming series on fixing Game of Thrones, so subscribe for that, you nerds. For the longest time, the people north of the wall were the enemies of everyone south of it. And when Jon attempts to change this, he is murdered for it. For the watch. It goes that deep. But after Jon's resurrection, the only mention of the possible catastrophe of wildling south of the wall is Ramsay's letter to Jon. To the traitor and bastard Jon Snow, you allowed thousands of wildlings past the wall. You have betrayed your own kind, you have betrayed the north. One might have thought this would continue to be quite the hot potato, especially amongst the Night's Watchmen and the Northern Houses, but this political issue simply disappears along with Jon's vows to the Watch. The very first thing we learn about Arya is that she wants to be her own person, not shoehorned into a life chosen for her by somebody else. You will marry a High Lord and rule this castle. No. That's not me. She also cares deeply for her family, and while her journey is one of a lone wolf trying to find her way back to the pack, she makes a ton of unlikely allies along the way. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. But by season 7 she's changed beyond recognition to this overpowered, entitled piece of work who eventually leaves her friends and family to become Dora the Explorer. And let's not forget, Arya never uses her face-shifting abilities she spent two seasons acquiring to do anything useful other than getting the phrase off of the showrunners' backs.
speaking of face shifting, it is often mentioned how the renowned assassins from Bravos are the kind of exclusive bunch you do not want to mess with. Which means desertion is not allowed. What you just did is punishable by death. But they still let her escape with all their skills and secrets. I'm going home. Then go! The least they could have done would have been to let Jack and catch up with Arya before the long night and have them call it water under the bridge as, you know, the world is about to end. Oh well. There's also no explanation as to why the Waif hates Arya. She's not ready. Perhaps she is, perhaps she's not. I've seen people speculate that it has to do with the Waif craving Jacken's attention, but if she's supposed to be no one, such cravings would never be accepted, let alone rewarded. You promise me? Don't let her suffer. In season 4, the dragons start getting a little raucous, and Daenerys eventually locks two of them up, which only seems to make them more angry while Drogon wreaks havoc. But in season 6, they've all been successfully rehabilitated and are impressively tame and coordinated, as if the initial problems never existed. As seen in House of the Dragon, dragons require training and disciplined riders to be cooperative, and even then you're never fully in control. And it doesn't stop there. Their increase in size means increased maintenance, a problem that was also soon abandoned. While I ensured our stores would last through winter, I didn't account for Dothraki, Unsullied, and two full-grown dragons. What do dragons eat, anyway? Whatever they want. In Season 6, we were all very excited, or at least I was, about the introduction of the Red Priestess Kinvara, who is brought in by Tyrion to propagate support for Daenerys and Marine. But, as we know, Season 6 is the point where world building kinda ceases to be a thing, and Kinvara's efforts, if there ever were any, are confined to the illustrious realm of off-screen. I will summon my most eloquent priests. They will spread the word. Kinvara, nor her eloquent priests, I mean breasts, I mean priests, are ever seen or heard of again. The Lannisters are one of, if not the, richest houses in Westeros, thanks to a few decades of clever management by your boy Tywin, as well as, you know, their literal gold mines. Have you ever heard the phrase, rich as a Lannister? But we also hear about the gold mines running dry on multiple occasions, implying that the Lannisters are losing their source of power. Summer has ended, hard days lie ahead. Our last working mine ran dry three years ago. If he was so clever, why didn't he take High Garden the moment your gold mines ran dry? And when Tywin dies, this should spell trouble on the double for our golden friends. Alas, this groundbreaking event never comes back to haunt them, when really it ought to have crushed them like a ton of bricks. On the topic of money... The Iron Bank will have its due. How they love to remind everyone. The Crown owes the Iron Bank of Brothers a tremendous amount of money. The Iron Bank of Brothers? We owe them tens of millions. I'm not worried about the Iron Bank. We both know you're smarter than that. If we fail to repay these loans, the bank will fund our enemies. You can't run from them, you can't cheat them, you can't sway them with excuses. One way or another, they always get their gold back. These conversations would lead you to believe that the Iron Bank will come down on you like the hammer of Thor, but this never happens to anyone. After Stannis dies, nobody seeks out Davos or goes to Dragonstone to collect. And when Bran takes the crown, there's no clarification as to the exorbitant debts remaining or how to pay them back. You're telling me the crown is three million in debt? I'm telling you the crown is six million in debt. How could he let this happen? With Tyrion as head of House Lannister, he inherits the crown's debt of over three million accumulated by Bobby B. Counting coppers, he calls it. A significant amount was also owed to the Tyrells, but that went away when they were destroyed. And upon sacking Highgarden, Cersei repaid whatever the crown owed the Iron Bank at the time, rookie mistake by the way, and then immediately took out another loan to pay for the Golden Company in the fight against Daenerys. 
Now, it could be argued that the Golden Company simply bet on the wrong elephant in that conflict. I wanted those elephants. But the crown of Westeros is still the institution that hired them, so a significant amount would be owed to them by someone. Sir Bronn of the Blackwater, Lord of High God, and Lord Paramount of the Reach and Master of Coin. How could he let this happen? Hey, who remembers Illyrio Mopatis? The North. Kind of forgot. Being a day one and Varys' best mate, Illyrio seemed like a pretty big deal once upon a time. If one hand can die, why not a second? The way these two talk, it seemed like they were playing the realm like their own private game of 5D Sivas, but after season one, he is never seen nor heard of again. Not even when Tyrion crashes at his place in season five. Set up from day one, the upcoming winter was supposed to be the chill of a goddamn lifetime. Feared us for the long night. There's a war coming, Ned. I don't know when, I don't know who we'll be fighting. And winter is coming. Eight seasons, nearly a decade in the making, but in the end, the long night was really just a dark battle, and winter lasted a good few weeks at best. Regardless, it would appear that, with their sophistication and extraordinary patience, the White Walkers would have some sort of explicit purpose, but that is also never revealed beyond being a bunch of Frankenstein's monsters. For example, there are the instances of Will in Season 1 and Sam in Season 2 being intentionally left alive to warn of their coming. Let me know if you agree with this or not, but this smacks of an elaborate plan to bait humans into making some sort of mistake, like... No, not sending half the cast on a suicide mission beyond the wall, obviously, but... something. In his first speech as president of the Iron Islands, Euron says this... And across the sea... There is a person who hates the great lords of Westeros just as much as we do. And promises to go to Marine to seduce Daenerys with his uh, impressive manhood. Along with my big... But, like a true politician, his promise is quickly forgotten when it's time to allocate public resources towards killing his political opponents. Where are my niece and nephew? Let's go murder them. And he soon finds himself courting another queen, which none of his voters seems to have a problem with. Quaith, the mysterious oracle who turns up in Qatar. Huh. Sorry, Karth. Is only ever seen by Daenerys in the books, but in the show, Jorah meets her too, which suggests that she's a real person. Who are you? I'm no one. It is widely speculated that Quaith, at least in the books, is Shira Seastar, a Targaryen bastard and lover of OG tree boy Brynden Rivers, which, if true, could explain her helping fellow Targaryen Daenerys out. But this is something the show doesn't explore at all. Dare I say it would have been wiser to simply omit Quaith instead of her being some half-ass deus ex machina who warns Jorah about the warlocks. Speak of the devils. When they kept coming after Daenerys in season 3, it seemed like the warlocks of Karth were here to stay. The warlocks. But they totally weren't. Craster's baby being carried into an awesome ice castle that I'm dying to know more about did not need introduction. But since the show went out of its way to show this, I'm kinda left asking, did these babies grow up or forever remain tiny? Do they train in the yard with a master of ice and a proud Night King watching over them? And more to the point, are these distinguished generals or whatever they are Craster's sons? What would Gilly do if she found out that her niece brothers are the baddies? Guess we'll never know. As pointed out in every era in Game of Thrones season 6, Ironborn culture is quite thoroughly abandoned, as Yara and Theon strike a deal for independence with Daenerys. Has the Iron Islands ever had a queen before? No more than Westeros. You son of a bitch! When a man gives me a crown, I pay the iron price. That is who we have always been. As if Balon weren't rolling over in the deep as it were, the same thing happens when Euron sets out to do Cersei's bidding to win her favor instead of taking what he came for by force. 
The surest way to a woman's heart is with a gift. I won't return to King's Landing until I have that for you. We are ironborn. We're not subjects. We're not slaves. We take what is ours. Oh, and it gets worse. Yara's deal is also completely forgotten about in the series finale, despite independence being handed out like charity. The North will remain an independent kingdom. After taking back Riveron from the Blackfish, Jaime installs Edmure as his loyal vassal. But shouldn't his loyalty at least be tested? The Tullys were sworn to Rob, so where were they when Jon was crowned king in the north? And where were they when every sword in the kingdoms was needed to fight the White Walkers? If the north indeed remembers, I feel like Sansa ought to have a bone or two to pick with her uncle Edmure at the council in the final episode, but yeah. As we know from season 1, Dothraki blood riders are sworn to their Khal in life as in death. He's no. In the event of their Khal being defeated, they would avenge him and then join him in the afterlife by suicide. Now, let's not forget that Daenerys made every single rider of her Khal Asar her blood riders. <laughs> And after failing to conquer the world, not only did she fail the prophecy of the stallion who mounts the world for the second time, but not one in her Khalasar so much as mentions it, or the fact that they're all honor bound to kill John and then themselves. Oh, and they hate witches with a passion. It is known. It is known. I kind of forgot. Realistically though, with so much power up for grabs, not all would go through with their mandatory suicides. But there should at least be fighting over who gets to lead them next, most likely resulting in factions breaking out based on previous hierarchies from before Daenerys united them. This should also, at least in theory, be somewhat of a pickle for the new king of Westeros, but since they all just conveniently pack up and go back to Essos to rape and pillage in peace, Dothraki culture was officially abandoned too. George R. R. Martin has explicitly said that he won't explain the magic of his world, including the Lord of Light, etc. But what we do know is that only death pays for life. And while the lives of Daenerys' dragons are paid for at the rather straightforward exchange rate of Drogo, Rhaegar, and Miri Mazdur, Beric Dondarrion's multiple resurrections remain a mystery, and no explanation is ever provided. Thoros, how many times have you brought me back? Five, I think. No, this makes six. It could be argued that his resurrections usually happen shortly after battles where lives are lost, but this is clearly not the case when the Hound kills him in Season 3. Lord, cut your life this man yourself. Also, even though Jon's resurrection is likely paid for with Shireen's life, we're left to speculate and assume this for ourselves without the show actually ever suggesting it. Okay, now this is a super interesting piece of the puzzle. Every time I come back, I'm a bit less. Pieces of you get chipped away. But even that is abandoned, as John never so much as reflects on the feeling of being brought back to life. Not even when directly asked about it. How did you survive a knife through the heart? I didn't. In season 2, the people's resentment towards the establishment resulted in an attack on the king by a mob of hungry peasants. And in season 5, the people's own sparrow was elevated to High Septon. You are the few. We are the many. But after Cersei blows up the Sept of Baelor, including many lords and religious leaders, none of this seems to matter to anyone anymore. The good people of King's Landing, let alone the rest of the country, suddenly don't give a damn about their faith, their food, their lord protectors, and that their supreme house of worship was just blown up by a tyrant they've resented for years. This also ends the plotline of the High Sparrow before we get to learn his true motives. Was he as power hungry and ambitious as the rest of them, or was he indeed the humble servant he claimed to be? Your guess is as good as mine. Also, who leads the faith of the Seven now after all their leaders were annihilated? Shouldn't grassroot factions spring up similar to the Sparrows or something? At the end of the show, with the country rather war-torn and with more than a few notable houses destroyed, 
Westeros must surely be riddled with problems, like who occupies castles like Storm's End, and will they simply submit to the likes of Gendry, a bastard who was legitimized and handed the castle by a foreign invader? And what about the politics of the Reach, after Bronn, a sellsword who doesn't even know how loans work, takes over as their Lord Paramount? I've never borrowed money before. I'm not clear on the rules. Who takes over the twins now that the Freys are gone? Does Sansa appoint someone of her choosing? Does Bran? Does Edmure? There is land in the Reach. Good land. The people that used to live there are gone. Where did those people go? Did they flee or die? Who manages Horn Hill and other important castles, lands and incomes that make the country go around? In Season 3, warging was made out to be quite common amongst the wildlings. What's wrong with him? Well, you've never met a warg. But after Aurel's death, no wildlings are ever seen to warg again, so they either forgot about the remaining wargs or chose not to mention how the last wildling warg had died. Even though that should be something of a big deal, at least to someone like Torment. To quote one of you guys, Sansa went from the most obnoxious character in TV to a sympathetic character who had been through some terrible shit to the most obnoxious character in TV. And I couldn't agree more. Starting out as an annoying little sh** with princess syndrome, Sansa soon realizes that all that glitters ain't gold, and in season 4, when faced with the opportunity to throw Littlefinger under the bus, she makes the pivotal decision to support him instead, turning victimhood into agency. But after being married off to Ramsay and enduring another stint of victimhood, she comes out the other side, um, how can I put this? The smartest person I've ever met. No, no, that's not it. Anyway, by season 7, Sansa is already back to her entitled ways, only now she's enjoying the power trip of being in charge. Which I guess we're supposed to think is empowering and cool? The point is, her arc of going from the most obnoxious character in TV to becoming likable and inspiring is well and truly abandoned. Oh, and Sansa's marriage to Tyrion was never annulled, and her forced marriage to Ramsay is certainly questionable. So, when Ramsay dies, the natural question becomes, is her marriage to Tyrion back on? Does this mean Tyrion is technically king in the north now? In any event, regardless of what I think, some lord or another should realistically have a problem with all this before she gets to be crowned queen in the north. After falling victim to being a character the showrunners didn't know what the f*** to do with, Rickon Stark neither gets the funeral nor the statue in the crypts he's entitled to. When it's time to invade the homeland, Daenerys leaves Marine in the capable hands of her favorite mercenary Dario Naharis. But this is the last we ever hear of Marine, or Dario for that matter, and we never get so much as a status update. Piss on that, send a raven. Daenerys also doesn't bring any significant wisdom or experiences from the seasons she spent there, leaving the Chronicles of Marine weirdly inconclusive and painfully pointless in the grand scheme of things. I mean, sure, they ended slavery, imposing sound Western values and all that, but what's to say slavery didn't return the moment Danny left for Westeros? Or are we supposed to believe that the entire Sons of the Harpy resurgence was quelled by Tyrion's threat to Yasan Sukagas at the end of season 6? Remind them what happened when Daenerys Stormborn and her dragons came to Marine. In the books, Prince Duran of Dorne is secretly plotting his revenge on the Lannisters for murdering his sister Elia and her children, while his brother Oberyn attempted a more direct kind of revenge. In the show though, Doran is a docile pussycat whose plot for revenge is abandoned in its infancy, and Doran is eventually killed by Ilaria, who in turn is killed by Cersei. Or is she? While Tyene was poisoned, Ilaria was purposefully kept alive to suffer for as long as possible. What's to say she wasn't alive when Cersei lost the capital? Yes, okay, but it's not like people haven't lived through worse. Also, after the Dornish army is supposedly destroyed by the Iron Fleet, the inevitable power vacuum that ought to be Dorn is never addressed. All we get is Dorny McDornface over here, and although he's pretty hot or whatever, I'm not convinced. Last but definitely not least, what did Podrick do to those girls? Just kidding.
Again, not all magic has to be explained. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed me going back to my usual style of content. Stick around to get notified whenever I post. There will be more Game of Thrones content coming out as we delve into how Game of Thrones should have ended. Look forward to that. Special thanks to all my supporters who used the links in the description. You guys are the best in the Seven Kingdoms. Have a great day and I'll see you again soon.